Preachers represent three different things to the people because of their brands of preaching. And in the face of criticisms, disagreements and controversies in Christendom in Nigeria, these preachers have stayed true to their convictions. One of the such preachers is the founder and president of Abel Damina Ministries International, Dr. Abel Damina, who disagreed with church leaders in the country on many fronts. Pastor Damina believes that a number of ministers have gotten church priorities wrong, hence the competition and insecurity in churches. He said most ministers now hide on the titles, material things and signs and wonders as marks of ministerial success. Joining us now from our Abuja studios for discussions on his disagreements with church leaders is the founder and president of Abel Damina Ministries International, Dr. Abel Damina, good to have you on the, this show this evening. So first off, let's understand the disagreement between your, you and members of your church. Could you put us in perspective what the issues are? And first off, you can also tell us the biggest factor that influenced your journey as a Christian. Well, Esther, thank you for having me this evening and good evening viewers out there. I'm so excited to be here. Um, just like Esther has said, um, I'm a church leader, so uh, it's not like I disagree with leaders. Uh, I'm a leader, and there are some of the fathers of faith that I look up to. And there are some that are my, you know, uh, at my age group, and they are my contemporaries in ministry, and there are those under me in ministry. Uh, I, I have no disagreements with them, uh, and the disagreement is not with persons specifically, but what seems to be like disagreement has to do with the, the scriptures, the scriptures which is the authority on which Christianity is practiced. And when we're talking about the scriptures, we're talking about a volume of 66 books that was written by 40 authors over a span of 1,500 years, three continents, three languages, you know, the authoritative, infallible word of Almighty God. The Bible is such a wonderful material, such a powerful book, an ancient material that requires interpretation. And sometimes where the disagreement seems to occur from is how the scriptures are interpreted. There could be no better way to interpret the scriptures than to learn from the author of the book himself. In John chapter 5 verse 39, Jesus said to the Jews of his day, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. So the scriptures carries with it the message of the Christ. In Luke chapter 24 verse 25 to 27, after Jesus rose from the dead on his way to Emmaus, he met two of his disciples, arguably Cleopas and the wife. They were discussing the event of the past three days and they were, you know, bringing their opinions into it. They said, well, we thought he was going to be the one that will bring us political emancipation. Others said, well, we thought he was going to bring us political relevance. But now just he died and he's not even able to, to, to rise. And to make matters worse, the women who went to the tomb said they met some angels who told them he was no longer there. And Jesus turned to them and said to them, O fools, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? So watch Jesus, the author of the book, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded, that word expounded is the first time it appears in New Testament Greek. Is the word daimenua in the Greek. It means he interpreted in all the scriptures the things, destination, concerning himself. So we say the Bible is a Christocentric material that carries with it a Christocentric message. That is, the 66 books of the Bible are tied together by one message, one character, and the emphasis of the book is the Christ himself. So we say the Bible is a Christocentric book, a message that is centered on the person of the Christ. It's not a message on prosperity. It's not a message on get, you know, get rich quick scheme. It's not a message on, on other things. It is centered on the person of the Christ. And the mission of the Christ is salvation. Matthew 1 21. She shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sin. 
So Jesus came for a specific mission to cure what man does not have the ability to cure. Before Jesus came, people were rich. Before Jesus came, people had houses. Before Jesus came, people had cars and all the wealth of this world. But there was one thing man was incapable of solving, and that is the sin problem. So Jesus, who was God, became a man in the person of Jesus, died on behalf of man to solve the issue of sin. Which means, therefore, that our theology of the Bible is Christology. And the message of Christology is soteriology, salvation, to save man from sin. Now, any preaching that takes you away from that tangent of the Christ, any preaching that takes you away from that tangent of salvation, it's not the gospel of Christ. In Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So the gospel right. is the gospel of Christ. Right, point taken there, Dr. Abel. But we also understand we have instances where uh, pastors have told church members to do some kind of ridiculous things. And pastors claim that they got the instruction now from the Holy Spirit. Now, when you speak about, when you speak against them, they also accuse you of being a carnal or uh, using human brain to judge things of the spirit. So how can we discern what is true and what is false? Okay, Esther, thank you for that question. To be able to discern what is true from what is false, it will be based within the confines of the scriptures. Any practice that is contrary to the rightly divided word of truth is not of God. It's not of Jesus. It's not of the scriptures. Because the scriptures must be rightly divided, which means that your knowledge of God must be situated within the rightly divided word of truth. Otherwise, people can say anything in the name of God. It's like some time back we had people in South Africa who were asked to eat grass in the name of God, to drink fuel in the name of God. I even heard of some people in Kenya that were brought into a room and locked in the room until they died in the name of God. All of these malpractices are as a result of people's inability to rightly divide the word of truth. Which means, therefore, that the Spirit of God and the Word of God agree. So if the Spirit of God is asking you to do something that contradicts what is in the rightly divided word of truth, don't do it. That's how to discern. You discern the Spirit by the written word. So the written word becomes a check and balance for whatever the Spirit says or whatever the Spirit never says. It's like somebody says, well, the Spirit says you should divorce, you, you know, you should divorce your husband and marry me. The Spirit can't say that because in the written scriptures, the Word of God is very clear about marriage. The Word of God is very clear about adultery and fornication. So, you cannot follow the Spirit contrary to... To the written word. So the check and balance to know through spirituality is the written word of God. That's why the Bible tells us, forever, O God, thy word is settled in heaven. Thou hast magnified your word above all of your name. So if any practice contradicts the rightly divided word of truth, it is not from God. Right, point taken there. So there was also there was a time the church in ancient times didn't allow Christians to access the scriptures and people dependent on the clergy to reveal what the scripture, the scripture said. So they also probably felt that there will be misinterpretations and confusion. Now, should, should such Christians depend on personal revelation or what the clergyman have agreed to be true? What are your thoughts? Yes, that, that period is what we call in church history the period of dark ages. And the reason why they were dark ages was because the word of God was not allowed. People are not allowed to look at the scriptures. God wants to have a, a relationship with everybody. God wants to know you. I, I mean, wants you to know him. And he wants you to know him within the written scriptures. So therefore, when people are deprived and denied access to the scriptures, then malpractices, of course, will be the order of the day. Malpractices of scriptural practices malpractices and abuses of the written word of God. And that is why we're grateful today. Everybody has a copy of the Bible. Some of us have four or five copies of the Bible. And the essence is so you can read. 
That's why if you observe, every time the Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees ask Jesus a question, Jesus will say to them, have you not read, have you not read the word anaginosko in the Greek? It means, are you reading and not paying attention? Paul will say, till I come, give attendance to reading. A eunuch was reading the Bible, and the Bible tells us, you know, and Philip asked him, understandest thou what thou readest? And he says, how can I understand except some man should guide me? So God has placed people to teach us the scriptures. But beyond that, we all have access to the scriptures. And if you understand that the scriptures are a contextual material, and context simply means you're able to look at the pretext and the post-text and see the line of discourse. That way you do not allow a preacher just pluck scriptures out of different places and make the Bible say what the Bible is not saying. Because the Bible has only one message. We don't have messages. We have a message. And that message is consistent all through the ages. If you look at the book of Acts, that's the message that was preached in the early church from Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Peter preached, Christ died, he was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In Acts chapter 3 and 4, Peter preached again, Christ died, he was buried. On the third day, he rose again. If you look at Stephen's sermon in the book of Acts chapter 6, verse 7, it is Christ died, he was buried. On the third day, he rose again. If you look at the early church in Acts chapter 5, verse 42, the Bible says daily in the temple and from house to house, they cease not to preach and teach Jesus Christ. If you look at Peter's sermon in the house of Cornelius, Peter preached Christ died, he was buried. On the third day, he rose again. If you look at Paul's sermons in Acts chapter 13, Christ died, he was buried. On the third day, he rose again. So there's a consistency of doctrine. And that is how you measure truth. It has to be one. It has to agree with the written scriptures and the messages of the early church. And with that being said, immortal, invisible, the only God is how Apostle Paul described God, which means God is spirit. So but what do you make of preachers claiming that God drank tea with them, that God is bearded, as Prophet Isaiah McWell claimed, or physically seeing Jesus as Apostle Suleiman did. Can man physically see God? Well, again, uh, you know, the Bible tells us that God is spirit, like you said, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then, of course, if God is spirit, then it means that God lives out of the immaterial world, even though he controls the material world. He lives in the immaterial and controls the material world. Now, so God drinking tea with somebody doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't, it doesn't even make Bible sense at all. If there was a God drinking tea anywhere, we would have seen it from the beginning of the scriptures, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We will have seen God drinking tea with Moses, drinking tea with Adam, drinking tea with Abraham, drinking tea with Joshua, drinking tea even with Jesus when Jesus became a man, or drinking tea with the apostles. You know, Christ Christianity is historic and apostolic, which means what the apostles never did and what, the, you know, what Jesus never did, nobody can claim he, God has done it with him because there's a laid down foundation. But Brother Paul says, no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid. The other day, I had a preacher from somewhere saying he, he went to heaven and he drove a Range Rover. That is a laugh. This is the kind of abuse that is carried out on the scriptures when the scriptures are not rightly divided, which means Range Rover has started exporting cars to heaven. It means even God may be driving a Mercedes Benz or maybe a limousine or maybe a Bentley. That's a laugh. That's a real laugh. And that kind of joke can only, you know, can only be taken by people who don't know the scriptures. Brother Paul had a vision of heaven. And the Bible says he was caught to the third heaven. And when he came back from that vision, he said what he saw, the human mouth cannot utter. That means when you really see into the heavens, when you really have a vision of the immaterial world, there is no vocabulary on earth that can accurately describe the glory and the beauty of the immaterial world. So when people come up with all those kind of things, you can quickly summarize that some of them just had maybe a malaria dream or maybe had a bad dream or maybe some childhood fantasy that played back in their subconscious mind. But when you look at the holy writ, the sound scriptures, you won't find any of such claims in the written word of God. And anything that is not consistent with the scriptures should be discarded 
and trashed away because the scripture remains a valid, valid authority of the revelation of God in the written book. Fair enough, uh, Dr. Damina. A preacher once claimed that Apostle Paul contradicted Jesus. Do you think this was the case? Do you agree? Baba Jide, you know, when you hear such things, you just laugh. Because the moment you the moment you begin to say such things, it means you are not consistent, you are not conversant, it means you are not you are not skilled in the scriptures. The scriptures are very consistent. The writings of Brother Paul in Galatians chapter one, Paul said, The the things I have written, I didn't receive it from man, I didn't learn it from any man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. In John chapter sixteen, verse twelve, Jesus said I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth. Which means in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what Jesus taught was not really what he wanted to teach. And not because he couldn't teach it, but because the people could not contain it. They couldn't receive it. So we see the spirit of Jesus, which is the spirit of truth, in brother Paul, advancing the teachings of Jesus in the epistles. And Brother Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, when I took my revelation and I submitted it to the apostles that were before me, Peter and the rest of them, they gave me a right hand of fellowship. So for somebody to say that the writings of Paul contradicted Jesus means he is not conversant with the written scriptures. Because if you observe, Jesus taught beginning at Moses and all the prophets, when Paul came, Paul taught beginning at Moses and all the prophets. There is consistency of theology. The reason why we have what we call the Holy Bible is because it is canonized. The 66 books were not the only books that were written by the early founding fathers of the church. There were many, many books that were written by the early fathers. But when they now sat down, the, the founding fathers of the church, they said, which, which material will we put together? that becomes the holy scriptures so they did what we call canonization the word canon means a measuring rod they came up with a measuring rod and began to take all the books that were written through scrutiny to see which books will pass the test of being canonized and the 66 books pass the test of being canonized why because number one this 66 books carries with it the message of a divine origin, the message of God. Number two, these 66 books are centered on the person of Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, his resurrection, whether in promise or in fulfillment. Number three, the reason why these 66 books are called the Bible or canonized is because they are tied together with one message, the message of the Christ. So for anybody to laugh at Apostle Paul, that person should be laughed at because that person doesn't even know what he's talking about. Okay, okay, fair enough. A Nigerian bishop uh, once said Job, a man described as uh, being without reproach, suffered personal losses because he did not pay tithes. Where do you stand on this? Okay, so now when it comes to the issue of fighting, the first thing to to settle this. What is tithe? The word tithe, T-I-T-H-E, is tent. It means tent. So where did that it begin from in the Bible? Can you hear me? Was yes, that I'm coming I, to Job. Okay. Was that why Job... No, that's not why Job suffered. No, it's not true. That's not why Job suffered. That's why I want to lay some framework and arrive at okay. Job. So where did tithe begin from? It started from Genesis chapter 14. Who started it? Abraham. Where did Abraham get it from? By his own personal violation. He went to war, won war, came back from war. On his return from the war, he met the king, Melchizedek, the king of Salem. And the Bible says Melchizedek blessed him. And Abraham gave Melchizedek, gave, he didn't pay, he gave Melchizedek a tent of all. So that's the origin of the fight. Now God wanted to relate with Israel in the book of Exodus chapter 19, one on one. And Israel said, no, we don't want God to relate with us. We are appointing Moses as a go-between us and God. God, if you want to talk to us, talk to Moses. Moses will talk to us. If, you, if we want to talk to you, we will talk to Moses. Moses will talk to you. So Moses became a go-between. 
Now, because Israel said they don't want to talk to God, Moses had to set up a Levitical priesthood. The Levitical priesthood is a priesthood whereby a tribe among the Israelites were set apart called the Levites, who were not supposed to walk. Their job was to stay in the temple, serve the temple, represent the people, work on behalf of the people in the temple. So Moses said, since the Levites will not walk, all Israel will have to pay tithe, 10%, so that through the tithe, the Levites can be taken care of, the poor can be taken care of, and the strangers can be taken care of. And if you read very carefully, the tithes were from the proceeds of farm. They were food products, if you read the Bible very carefully. So, never at any time has it ever been that God protected anybody because the person paid tithe. Never at any time has it been that God blessed anybody because the person paid tithe. God blesses people because God is generous. God blesses people because God is a loving father. God blesses people. He makes his son to shine on the good and on the bad. He makes his rain to fall on the good and on the bad. That's God. So Job now himself said the reason why he was afflicted was because of fear. In Job chapter 3 he said the things that I feared has greatly come upon me. Now, if you read Job very well, after 41 chapters of the book of Job, in 42, Job chapter 42, verse 5, Job himself said, All I ever said about God from chapter 1 to 41 was based on rumor. Don't take me serious. It was based on rumor. He said, But now my eye seeth God. Now I have understood God. Which means everything Job said in the 42 chapters, his claims about God, we are based on rumor and nobody wants anybody to have a perspective of him based on rumor that's why at the end of the book of job the bible says job said now my eye see it that means now i have come to know who god is and the moment job got to that level of revelation his captivity was turned around so for somebody to say job didn't pay tithe that's why he was afflicted maybe the person didn't read the bible very well because if you read clearly job said it is my fear that opened the door for Satan to attack me. But when Job's eyes opened and he understood God's character, his captivity was turned around. I hope that's clear. Let's talk about um, prosperity preaching, which uh, appears to be the most popular strain of Christianity in, um, in the world today. What do you have against prosperity preaching because there's a YouTube video in which you are seen criticizing um, the idea of prosperity preaching and all that. You know, uh, uh, Babaji, the, the, the truth of the matter is there is no preaching called prosperity preaching in the entire Bible. There is one gospel. It is the gospel of Christ. Romans 1 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In Romans chapter 10, Paul said, how can they believe on whom they have not heard? So the gospel is the gospel of a person, the person of Jesus Christ. And like I said during the introduction of this time we're having together, I said there is only one mission Jesus has, to save his people from their sins. That's why I keep telling preachers, all this prosperity, you know, noise around. Look at the ministry of Jesus, who is the model of ministry. Who followed Jesus and became a millionaire? Who followed Jesus and prospered materially? Look at it. All of them that followed Jesus, they became preachers of the gospel. What about the early apostles who are the foundation of the church? Paul, Peter, James, John, all of them were not millionaires. They were preachers of the gospel. In fact, Paul said, anybody that reduces the gospel to gain his godliness, he says such a person is destitute of the truth. And he's doting about things that he doesn't know. Because the gospel is godliness with contentment. And that contentment can only be found in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So the mission of Jesus is not to give you money. The mission of Jesus is not to make you the richest man on earth. The mission of Jesus is to save his people from their sins. But does God have anything against prosperity? No. Why? He created a planet and put solid minerals, oil wells, agriculture, technological abilities all in the planet so that man, whether Christian or non-Christian, can explore and use it to serve society 
and in exchange for his services is paid for what he is able to solve in society there's a difference between that and the gospel of christ the gospel of christ guarantees eternal life eternal life with god almighty i don't know if that helps but the, the people regarded as uh, fathers of the christian faith today in nigeria and even beyond the boundaries of Nigeria, are people identified with what we now have come to know as prosperity, prosperity preaching? Uh, Is there not a contradiction here? Well, it doesn't matter the age of a person. If it is a Christian practice, we stay with the book. No preacher, whether father of the faith, son of the faith, junior of the faith, that has the audacity to abuse the integrity of God's word. The Bible is the book of the practice of the faith. So if anybody is preaching anything that is contrary to what is written in the Bible, it doesn't matter his age. He is not the one that our loyalty is to. Our loyalty is to Jesus who died for us, was buried, and gave us a book that contains the message that all of us must abide by. That's why Brother Paul would say in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him, him, because the message is the message of a him, him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Baba Jide, there is another gospel. It sounds like the gospel, but it's not the gospel of Christ. And Paul says, there are some of you that have been removed from the gospel of Christ to another gospel. And he says, he says, this gospel is a troubling gospel. This gospel is not the gospel of Christ. This gospel is trouble. Then Paul said, whether I, whether we that have preached to you and laid the foundation, or any other person, or an angel from heaven, preach anything to you other than that which has been taught in the book, let him be accursed. The word a cause is the word anathema. It means let him be cut off. Disregard him. Don't pay attention to him. If he's preaching anything that is contrary to the written word of God. The word of God is superior to anybody's age, anybody's experience. We live by the word of God. And in the word of God, prosperity is not the gospel. And let me tell you the downside. That is why many Christians are frustrated. Because they were told if you pay tight, you will never be poor. They pay tight until they are broke. They are trekking. Nothing came. They were told if you give to God, you will never be poor. They gave and gave and gave and poverty has not left them. They were told, they were given a version, a brand of Christianity that is not a Bible brand. And the message sold out is a transactionary message. What kind of father will God be where you have to bribe him with some little money, sow some seed? You know, sacrifice something before God can answer your prayer. That sounds like a shrine or idol worship where you have to pay, you have to mobilize God as if he's one of the Nigerian contractors. God doesn't need to be mobilized. God doesn't need to be paid. In the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 32, the Bible tells us, He that spared not his son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Everything that comes from Jesus is freely given. In the book of Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus sent the early apostles to go and preach, he told them, as you go preaching, freely you have received, freely give. Anything that comes from Jesus is free. You don't need to sow a seed for God to answer your prayer. You don't need to give money for God to meet your needs. God doesn't meet your needs because you did something. He meets your needs because he's a loving father. He takes care of us because he loves us. Simply that. I mean, which of us biological fathers will have to be paid before you talk to your child? Your child will give you a little money before you talk to your child. Your child will give you a little money before you solve your child's problem. What kind of father is that? And then Jesus said, if you that are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So that brand of Christianity to some of your that is tied to a to transactionary God it's not the Bible brand. Okay, so Dr. Danga, let's go to some of your claims. Biblical evidence declines some of, some of the things that you support, that, it, that Satan that sent down the fire during the contest between Elijah and the prophet of Baal. Now, frankly, why would Satan want to destroy his fran franchises? And why do pastors like to bend the scriptures like you did in that situation? Well, again, you know, 
time will not even allow me here to go into a lot of exigencies, but let me quickly take, you know, give you a little explanation to that. When, we, when I said that the fire that came down, when Elijah brought fire and destroyed those people in 2 Kings chapter 1, I said that fire was not from God. And it's very easy. When you believe that Jesus is God who became a man, that means what Jesus doesn't do, God doesn't do. Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. What I see my father do, that is what I do. In Luke chapter 9, the disciples of Jesus saw that Jesus wanted to go through Samaria. And the Samarians refused Jesus passing through their city. And the disciples said, should we command fire to come down and destroy this city like Elijah did? The Bible says Jesus turned and rebuked them and said to them, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to destroy, to save them. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he will not allow them to bring down fire, in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it means if he was standing where Elijah was bringing down fire, in 2 Kings chapter 1, he will have rebuked Elijah. That is why it is not that fire that destroyed people is not from God. But there is a second fire, and that's where people get confused, and that's why I always say to okay. people, don't follow social media clips of my teaching. Look for the full teachings on YouTube on my channel. The second fire that Elijah brought down, that consumed the sacrifice, consumed the fire in that same second Kings, was the fire of judgment. The fire of judgment. And if you observe, it consumed the sacrifice, it consumed the wood, it consumed the water. That is not human consumption. That was judgment against the gods, the idols in Egypt. I hope that's So who, who killed the Egyptians uh, in the Red Sea? Was it Moses? If we are to uh, agree with your yes. analogy. Yes. Was it, did Moses have the power to, to, to take human life in the manner that it happened when the Red Sea was parted and... Um, Pharaoh's uh, army were consumed. Are you saying that well, again, this God cannot yes. kill? Yes. Are you saying in essence yes, that God, God, never, God does not kill? So who killed Baba people? Jireh, God never who killed before. Who God killed people kill. in and Sodom and Gomorrah? Killed. Who killed people in Sodom okay, so and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, so Both Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and, okay, so Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was a type of the end of the world. Noah preached, I mean, uh, Lot preached, preached the people in Sodom. They refused to receive the gospel. They refused to receive the gospel. At the end of the day, when Lot left and the angels left with Lot, the presence of God was out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Then fire started raining. And Jesus said, like it was then, so shall it be in the day of the Son of Man, which means when the gospel is preached and a man refuses to receive the gospel, at the end of the age, when judgment comes, that person will be judged. And that judgment is the absence of God. Because if God is presented and you reject God, then God will have to leave you. That's what John 3.16 says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth not is condemned already. That condemnation is judgment. That's what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what happened to the world of Noah. And that is what will happen at the end of the age. Those who reject Jesus will be judged. And that judgment is the absence of Jesus. He will not force you. He's not a tyrant. He makes appeal. When you accept, he comes in. When you reject, he stays out. Now, the absence of God is destruction. That's why 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 will say, This is the message that we have heard. That God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. God is absolute light. God is absolute life. God is absolute love. Somebody somewhere said to me, Dr. Damina, it's true what you're saying. If God is really the one killing, then what is Satan's work? If God is the one killing, then what is Satan doing? Jesus told us in John chapter 10 verse 10, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill and to destroy but i am come that you may have life and that you may be abundant in hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 the bible says seeing then that the children are partakers of flesh and blood he likewise himself 
partook of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So the killer from Genesis has been the devil. The only part that God plays is to bring life, to bring intervention, to bring healing, and to bring restoration. God is good. He has always been good. He will always be good. And like I said, these are just teasers. They're sound exegesis where we can take scriptures and open them up properly in the light of Christ and see the character of God. God is not bipolar. He's not good and bad. God has only one single character. He's good and his mercies endure it forever. So there are, there are Christian clerics known to pitch their tents with political candidates, you know, and some politicians. Now, what should be the attitude of a New Testament believer when it comes to politics or partisan politics? Well, when it comes to partisan politics, <laughs> even the Bible does not have much to say about partisan politics. You, you must remember, when Jesus was on earth as a human being, he lived under a government that was not good at all. There was tyranny. There was tyranny. Jesus was alive. They took John the Baptist and killed him. And Jesus said nothing. He made no comment. When Paul had an opportunity to come before the corridors of politics, he preached the gospel to them. All right? So the job of the church is to pray for government, support government. But as a child of God, you have a civic responsibility to your nation. So what can a Christian do where politics is concerned? Exercise your civic right. Vote, support candidates you believe in, and if you qualify to rule or to occupy a particular position, you can vie for it. Because you're wishing your nation well, you're wishing your, your, your society well, and you want to contribute to the development of your society. That is the responsibility of a believer. And of course, pay your tax. As a child of God, you pay your tax to government to help government function well. But that is the only thing that the Bible prescribes for a child of God where politics and government is concerned. All right. With that... So the question he asks is, was it right? Yeah, or is it right for church leaders to pitch their tents with tent. particular candidates exactly. and even uh, ram okay. that candidacy okay. down the throat of, of church of members. Church members. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Capital N-O. No church leader should take side with a political candidate. And the reason is this. A pastor, a church leader, is a father. And in that congregation, there are people from different political divides. And as a father, he's supposed to wish everybody well. He may have his own preference, but it is strictly and exclusive to himself. He's supposed to allow people practice what they believe, support the candidates they believe in, you know, vie for the offices they believe in. Okay, if a pastor has three, four candidates that are vying for one office, what, what, who will he support? He will have to support all of them, wish them well, pray for them. So for a, a church leader to camp with a political candidate openly and even force it down the throat of his neighbor, he has gone out of the ethics of ministry completely. All right, and that's where we have to leave it. Thank you so much, uh, founder and president of Abel Damina Ministries International, Dr. Abel Damina. We appreciate your time with us on Journalist Hangout. Thank you, this Esther.